Uh, morning, everyone. I have a day job. I work at the University of Cambridge. Um, I also help co-found some clean tech startups. And as people in my line tend to, we get involved in policy committees and stuff. So if you want to ask nasty questions about all sorts of things, throw them at the end. I am from Merthyr, the Brecon Beacons. It's about 50 miles that way, which is about three hours of fast driving <laughs> around here. It's a, it's a little bit like this place, except it's beautiful and not as flat. <laughs> Come on, if you've been there, you do know. Uh, I hope there is an arc, a bit of a story this morning in my presentation. I'm going to start, I hope, by having a good anger session. It's Saturday morning, we need to wake up. So I hope I'm going to make you angry, and I hope we're going to share a bit of anger. Then I'm going to try and give you another pair of glasses to see the world through metaphorical and physical. These glasses are amazing. I have an eye problem. And uh, I'm a cyclist, and I can't deal with bright sunlight. These reduce the light by 30%, which is fantastic for my eyes. And they make the world brighter. <laughs> I try, try. It, this is my version of drugs. You put these on, <laughs> and it makes the world a happy place. So I would recommend a different lens to see the world through. And I'll try and offer a couple of lenses through my chat. And I'd like to end very clearly with some hope. I'm going to try and explain how we might be able to do things with the factories of the world. We're all surrounded by the products of our industrial system. The industrial system started about 250 years ago, not, not far from here, in fact. There are many claims to the origin. And it helped. My mum used to take, I used to go to school on Monday morning. It was always a Monday morning thing. I don't know why. But on Monday morning, mothers, yes, all women, would start washing clothes. And when you came home from school, eight hours later, they were still washing clothes. Now, the washing machine had been invented 60 years previously. It's not the inventor of the washing machine that took my mother out of that drudgery. It's the fact that the industrial system eventually worked out how to make a door for 50 pence, not for 50 pounds. And that made those things available and brought a lot of people out of drudgery. But we all know the unintended consequences. We are already operating outside of planetary boundaries. The system that we built that seemed like a good idea when it was niche and we were only offering these products to a small number of people doesn't work when we want to give it to everyone. And we don't want to hold it back. We don't want to make the products of industry only available to a few lucky gets. Right? We want to share the joy, but we can't. So the system has to be different, and I hope that I can show you some ways in which the system might be different in the future. So let's start with the anger. I'm going to ask you in a minute to come up with your favorites. These are some of my current favorites. How many join me in the, why the heck are we worrying about using rather complex biology, chemistry, call it what you will, to change the food production system, when after we've produced it, we are typically throwing away 50% of edible food? Can we solve that problem first? I, I don't understand why we want to spend billions of dollars and take existential risks when we could just stop throwing shit away. Right? And this is my research. This is what I do. I work on what we would typically call... Um, when you become a professor, by the way, which I, which I am, uh, it's a weird thing. It's a job title for life. And you get asked, what would you like your job title to be? And I asked to be a professor of common sense. <laughs> Everybody laughs. And that was the reaction I got, so I backed off, right? And I've got some other silly, very technical title. Common sense is not common, right? We need to learn why. I actually, that's my life's work, is trying to understand common sense and why it doesn't bloody happen. Anybody else angry about anything? 
Come on, people, give me your system inefficiency, the thing that drives you crazy. Just one or two. Somebody's hand up. Just shout. Really interesting. You could go to the BBC World Service and listen to me trying to answer that exact question, uh, which is on, uh, I can't remember the name of the program. I'll send you a link. We'll do anger at the end. I only wanted one example because I'm going to give you my personal <laughs> really wind-up favorite. After today, I promise you, you won't forget this one. The International Energy Authority. This is 2011 figures. $523 billion. Can, can you imagine what a billion dollars is? I can't. It's just a word, right? $523 billion of taxpayers' money was given to oil and gas companies. And we argue about subsidizing wind. This is not Greenpeace's numbers. This is the International Energy Authority. The latest numbers for 2014 take it over a trillion. One over $1,000 billion. And again, you're sitting there going, well, what's the difference, right? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> when you include the carbon cost, it is now calculated at over 5 trillion US dollars is subsidizing oil and gas companies. For the, any economists in the room who are willing to admit it? <laughs> okay, excellent, none. The global economy is 70 trillion. We are already using taxpayers' money. 1% of all of the money flows in the world goes from taxpayers to oil and gas companies. Please, hands up if you're, excuse me, young man. Do you know, put your fingers in the air. Could you do this for me? Hands up if you're bloody angry, right? <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think you may know that word, by the way. It wasn't that rude, really. So we're angry. Let's get a start. And the anger, I think, is caused by system stupidity. And I'd like to start with some messages that are much simpler than solving whole system problems and build up to it. Let me talk about how the industrial system has to change. These are pretty substantial numbers. I personally don't want to withhold that movement away from drudgery that my mother gained from the rest of the world. And if we're going to allow the rest of the world some form of middle class existence, an escape from drudgery, an escape from ill health, and access to water and energy, then the factories of the world are going to be producing four times more value by 2050 than we're already producing. And we're already messing the planet up. That's an interesting challenge. We know that even if we just produced what we produce today, we're going to have to learn how to be clean neighbors, not poison ourselves. And by the way, in, in typically in very advanced countries, factories are very clean neighbors. It's when you go looking down the supply chain and looking in different parts of the world, you go, wow. I mean, there are just lakes of shit in places. It's horrible. But typically, we clean neighbors in the developed economies, less clean in the less developed economies. But we all have to learn how to live with 80% less greenhouse gas emissions and halving the resources that we're going to take. That is quite a challenge. That's the one that I get involved in because I think this is an Andy thing. You know, why pick a small problem? Why pick a small fight if you can have a really big one? <laughs> but if you can have a really big one, have lots of friends and stand at the back, <laughs> right. which is, so I'm mentally right now, I'm at the back and you lot are at the front and the fight is over there, right? And we'd all like to do it together. I'm going to have a little talk about efficiency. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit of an efficiency geek. A bit, a bit, as in obsessive compulsive. <laughs> if only, if only we were efficient, we would be making such a massive contribution. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about efficiency and what does that mean. Now, this is a slide that I've taken from um, a good friend of mine who works for a very well-known company that makes very well-known products. I'd just like to point out some things. 
In 2006, they sent their last kilogram of waste to landfill. We probably won't achieve that on this site. And this is across 10 massive factories. In five years, they reduced the energy to make their product by 44%. I, do, I go to factories all the time. I believe that on average, factories can reduce the energy it takes to make their products by about 8% per year, infinitely, forever. Well, that would be good, wouldn't it? Can we get on that pathway? Because there is a difference between what is possible and what is currently being achieved. What is currently being achieved is about zero. It's effectively zero. And it could be 8% per annum. And this is a big user of energy. Industry use typically about 30% of energy in an advanced country, a post-industrial country like Britain or the US. In China, it's about 76%, sorry, 73% of all energy use is associated with industry. If you could reduce that by 8% per annum, how many power stations could you turn off immediately? And you could breathe the air. Now, one argument is that this company in 2001 must have been a pretty stupid company if it could find 44% energy in reduction in five years. <laughs> Toyota in Europe. This is a world-leading company in my subject area, right? In 2001, Toyota was the world's most admired manufacturing company. So if the best company in the world can do 8%, what can you do? So we've got some lovely pictures. Uh, these slides are actually directly taken from uh, Steve, a friend of mine who works at uh, Toyota and leads their activities across Europe. And they've got lovely pictures. I like this graph. 77% reduction in energy in the factory near Derby in England. So they can now make four cars for the energy it used to take to make one car. And they've done that without buying expensive equipment or putting up a wind turbine in the car park. So now, <laughs> now I need some audience participation. Sir, could you come and join me? And I'm going to give you a free unit of electricity. Yes? It would be lovely. And I need a female in order to have some balance. No, I need you to stay up here, sir. Can I have your help, ma'am? I'm going to give each of these one unit of electricity, and they're going to spend it in a factory. Could you stand behind that one? And they're going to spend... This is a true story. I phoned uh, a friend who works for a global chocolate company. They have many factories. And he was talking to me about two factories that they had, and these factories make the same chocolate bar. Can you guess what's under there? Just have a guess. Go on. It's chocolate, right? Whoa. Repeat the question again, please. There's no question yet. So, he's telling me a story. He's got two factories. They make the same chocolate bar, and they have the same equipment in those factories, and they make the same volume of the same chocolate bar on the same equipment. One factory, can you please open that up and lift, show the audience what you've got. In one factory, one unit of energy makes one chocolate bar. Other brands are available. <laughs> Sir, could you lift that up and show us what you've got? I'd, people would like to see this. Do you want some help showing it? Uh... Or you just like to keep them, really? <laughs> Six chocolate bars. Six chocolate bars, people. That's the difference. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to share that amongst the audience? Yeah. You can keep one. 600% difference without technology. It's about leadership and it's about imagination. And I asked this person, well, what's the difference between these two companies? And he said, Brian. And I, and I <laughs> you know, I live in a world of acronyms and I'm thinking. So I go, well, right, well, well, what does Brian stand for? And he said, well, there's this book called Brian. And Brian is just an energy geek pedant, a bit like me. And he's spent 20 years in the one factory just saving energy. And over time, that, well, Dan, are you happy? It, 
we saved 500%. All the batteries come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. 500% difference just using his own personal energy and imagination, not spending stupid amounts of money. I hope that you didn't understand how much can be gained by just being efficient. Right? Most people are wasteful to a degree that you simply don't understand unless you're an efficiency nerd like me. I would encourage you to be an efficiency nerd. The other thing I would suggest is that that second factory, which is amazingly efficient, could probably get better by another factor of six. Uh, I won't explain how, but just bear with me because the slides would be really boring because at that point you've got to start doing some really clever stuff, but not expensive stuff, clever stuff. So we can make things massively better than we're making them today. Why don't we? And I think there's an interesting debate about the problems of the cost of energy, the cost of water is simply too cheap, the fact that people don't have these skills, and so we spend a lot of time helping people gain the skills. We put the glasses on and we go around and we go, hey, look at that, there's energy being wasted. Hey, what's happening to that water? Let's turn people so that they can get these, give people a skill so that they can take those classes into every walk of life. So I think the problem is about leadership, not about technology. I hope you're uh, with me on that. Now we try to work out, what does this mean if you do it, I mean, one factory is an example. What happens if you do it at the level of a nation? So we did some calculations. Sorry for those of you who aren't from Britain, but we did a calculation at the scale of Britain. And don't worry about the maths, but we basically went to each sector, took the best factory, took the rest, and said, what would happen if the rest went halfway to the best? Halfway. Can we accept that halfway between shit and good is, is possible, right? <laughs> Well, what happens if you go halfway from shit to good is, at the level of the nation, we generate 10 billion pounds profit. That's 12% improvement in industrial profitability. We Remember, we're not spending any money to do this, or hardly any money. We generate 300,000 jobs, and we save 27 million tons of CO2, about 4.5% of the entire UK production of CO2. Why aren't we doing this, people? Right? Well, I, if you've got the answer, come and tell me in the coffee break. Okay? Because I spend my life trying to answer that question because it, it just screams to be done. Just do it. I think we might be in the right place. Now, I'm going to... You know, when I do this... Uh, you get cynics in the audience, funny enough, when you do it with uh, industrialists. And uh, somebody from, not this company, but somebody from uh, a well-known cement company said, yeah, well, Steve, yeah, that happens. You can do that in car companies and in all of the other examples you're given. But we in the cement and the steel industry, for example, we've been using a lot of energy for a long time. It's 40% of our cost. We have been worried about energy efficiency forever. You couldn't do it in our factory. So I said, okay. Bring me to your factory and give me half of the money I save. They declined. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking, what's to lose, right? But they declined. Anyway, uh, what, by the way, why would they decline? If I didn't succeed, I'd be a fool, and they would be a fool for inviting me. If I did succeed, they'd be a fool for inviting me because I'd be showing them how to do their job. It's a lose-lose situation. And we have to understand that's the psychology of why things are inefficient very often. Mm -hmm. For them, efficiency can be a lose-lose. Wow. And we need to turn that around. Anyway, so he, and then he said, right, well, I'm not going to invite you in, but what would you do? And I said, well, I've never been in your factory, so I can't. But the first thing I do is make sure that we sell people the right amount of cement. On average, you might remember a statistic previously, when we're building a building site, a new building, we overorder materials by about 33%. So people are buying cement and then not using it, buying concrete and then it doesn't go into the building. Now, we have got a good recycling system. It's turned into aggregate and it goes into roads. But you've paid top dollar to put it into a building and you haven't put it into the building. So I said, so the first thing I do is make sure the customer ordered the right amount. 
And this gentleman's answer was, you're cheating. <laughs> but there are clever people in the audience. I can see one or two. <laughs> and I know that you know why he said that, right? It's cheating because if they sell less cement, they make less profit. And part of the system that is broken is the link between being efficient and profit. You'd imagine that being efficient generates more profit, and I've got plenty of examples of that being true. But in this case, if you sell less of your product to make the customer just as happy, you are less profitable, and that's not a smart thing for a company to suggest as a strategy. So a lot of our research is around changing business models. So I'm going to give you some examples of some what I think are really quite interesting business models. Business models, uh, I'm an academic, I'm allowed one definition even in a due lecture. A business model is the logic of value exchange. So I give you value, you give me value. Typically, I'm selling you something and you give me money in return. That's the most common form of value exchange. I would love to do the drawing of the value exchanges of the due lectures. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And real life is a bit more complicated than that. And we help companies analyze the real complexity of value exchange and find new opportunities to do it. So I'm going to rush through a couple of examples of interesting changes to value exchange and what it implies. This is one of the startup companies that I've helped co-found. It's called River Simple. Google it. It's quite fascinating. You'll see a video. Uh, here's the prototype car at the launch. So it's a car company. It's a hydrogen fuel cell car company, and it's got seven integrated strategies, one of which is that you can't buy the car. You can only rent it per month and per mile, or per month and per kilometer, depending on where you live. So it's a type of mobile phone contract. Here's the important bit. We pay the insurance bill. We pay the maintenance. We do the service and we put the fuel in, and you don't pay. So you give us one check per mile, and we put the fuel in. What does that immediately change about the car industry? It means that if you use less fuel when driving, we make more money. Well, I tell you, guess who's got the knowledge to make you less, use less fuel? We do. We're the experts. We know how to put things in cars that will make it go further for less fuel. You fools, all of you, have no idea how to give us value in return. So we're completely scared of you as customers, and that's why we continue to sell you the way ca uh, cars the way we sell you them currently. We don't think our customers are very smart. So you are not going to give us a share of the benefits that I'm going to give you if I give you a 90 mile per gallon car, and it's perfectly possible. Everybody knows how to make 90 mile per gallon cars. They're easy. I mean, really easy. Really. I mean, really. To the camera. Really, really <laughs> easy. Okay? So why don't we have tons of them on the road? It's the same problem as the cheating cement company. The company that can deliver the 90 mile per gallon car can't necessarily deliver profit from the same arrangement. By putting the fuel cost in, that's one of the key things that we're doing in changing our arrangement. What does that mean in numbers? Um, I don't know how many of you European understand one liter per 100 kilometers. I know we've got a one, at least one stupid Danish person here. Uh, you know, one liter per 100 kilometers. Is that okay? Do you want to tell anybody what it is in miles per gallon so these stupid imperial people <laughs> understand? It's about 260 miles per gallon. It, that car that you can see there can go 260 miles on one gallon equivalent because it's hydrogen, not petrol. So it doesn't have CO2 emissions anyway. It is possible to build 250 mile per gallon cars. It is not possible to make money from them. So the problem isn't the technology. The problem is the logic of value exchange and learning how to make money. So different, different unlocking of value. Uh, this company, British Sugar, have a factory that's about 50 miles away from where I work in Cambridge. It's in the fens. It is very obvious. The fens are very flat. The factory is very tall. 
so you can see it. Don't ever drive towards it in a straight line. You will find yourself in water because the fence have all these waterways going everywhere. Now, the normal way to make sugar, you can work backwards from here. In most factories, you follow this pathway. And that's the only thing that you see in the factory. And this factory had a fantastic insight a couple of decades ago and said, well, wait a minute. Things are arriving in the lorry. We've already paid for them. The farmer has put thought and energy and attention into putting them in the back of the lorry and delivering to them to us. So instead of putting them to one side, we're going to find a way of making money from them. And they started with obvious and easy things like topsoil and stones. And they bought themselves some machinery to take some of the pulp from around the sugar beet and that's turned into animal feed. And they went, wow, this is really good. We're getting money for something that we're not paying for. It, we're already paying for it, right? Fantastic idea. So then they started to get really clever. I mean, chemically, biologically clever. And now we're going to do some clever things here, and we're going to sell betaine and bioethanol and raffinate and vinas, whatever those are, right? <laughs> per kilo, which one do you think is the most profitable. Do you think it's this stuff that we've no idea of or the sugar? Right? Per kilo, this is good stuff to sell. It's worth a lot of money and they've already got it in the back of the lorry. And then they realized they've got a power station to generate heat. You need lots of heat to make sugar. First of all, to extract it from the sugar beet. Then it's liquid and you've got to get rid of all the water in it so it becomes dry sugar. So you need a lot of heat and they've got a power station to do that. And some of that heat comes out as low-grade, what we call low-temperature heat. And I went, what are we going to do with that? Well, I didn't know this. Um, hands up, those of you who love tomatoes. Tomatoes evolved in a period in the past when there was more CO2 in the atmosphere. So they really gobble the stuff up. And if you have a greenhouse and you pack it full of tomatoes, you can pump your CO2 from your power station into the greenhouse and the tomatoes going, oh, whoa, we love this and we grow faster. You've got low-grade heat coming out of your factory, which is warming up the greenhouses. So this sugar factory is now the second biggest grower of tomatoes in Britain. And the only thing it has to buy is seed. Everything else is already free. So when you add all that up, this rather clever place is the second cheapest place to make sugar in the world, in one of the highest wage countries in the world. Imagination, right? It's, please, can we use this thing a little bit more cleverly? I've got to say, I love this story. Uh, I'm a man bag man. <laughs> but not this one. Uh, because I can't afford it. Do Google it, Elvis and Cressy, um, they're just people like us, actually. They're one of those stories. In fact, Chrissy Westling, next year, do, less, do lectures. You need her, right? And what they did, they're very nice people, and they, went to the, they met people from the London Fire Brigade and realized that after so many years, the fire hoses are thrown away because they don't work so well. And they took some home, and they went, wow, what are we going to do with that then? This is a story that I heard about seven times yesterday in the different businesses, right? It was a bit like, wow, what are we going to do then? Oh, well, I'm a bit annoyed. I'm up a mountain and I'm cold. It's the equivalent, right? And they've got this fire hose. And they went, well, and some, and some said, well, can you make me a belt? And they, so they made this friend of theirs a belt, and then they made a belt for themselves. And went, bloody hell, this belt is nice. And people started going, can I have one? And then they went, well, what else? And we're making handbags. Go and Google it, right? The photos are fantastic. They sell for over 200 pounds. The raw material is free. <laughs> <laughs> What's not to like, right? <laughs> and they donate 50% of their profit to charity. They're also employing a lot of local people. And part of the things that we're doing with them and strategizing with them is about how we can change the production system so that people can do a lot of this at home. People who are stuck at home and who can't go out and work in factories or in offices, these are not, some of the tasks associated with these things are massively skilled. Many of them are not, and we're trying to find ways of engaging with 
local, uh, typically mums and people with restricted mobility, uh, some of whom are in prison. <laughs> to help in the production of some of these products. Right. Four things we've learned. Been doing this for a long time. You have to be, if you want to be good at the things that I'm talking about, you've got to be good at four things. I've talked about efficiency. Uh, I think it's really important to learn how to internalize things. At the moment, a lot of things that are external to the business model, we think we always have to leave them out there. Well, use your brain and find a way of bringing them in. Things that are wasteful can be turned into what we call internalities. You have to be good at working with other people, I'm afraid, because not many people have billion dollar budgets to make everything happen themselves. And again, you heard, I think, really good stories of, all, of examples of all of these things yesterday. And if you're really going to go the whole hog, if you want to get to those 2050 goals, you have to be good at whole system design. I've promised to end with a little bit, little bit of hope. I hope I've started by making you angry. I hope I've given you a bit of lens. I'm going, whoa, the world is, that's interesting. And I hope that you believe that in the short term, we can do some fantastic things. Join the geeky world of efficiency, please. And be angry and not be happy with 2% improvement. We need to be 50% better in almost everything we do, and we can be, so we should be. In the medium term, there's hope that comes partly from technology, but largely from finding new ways of delivering value. And in the long term, I do believe there's hope in system transformation, but that's another lecture. Thank you.